second presentation this morning. Uh, it's the second of three, and uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce uh, Professor Kamal Alamar uh, from Edith Cowan University, who is the uh, project leader on this project, which is fibre optic sensor for water quality monitoring. Um, Kamal, Professor Kamal Alamar has spent the last 18 years uh, in research on photonics, fibre optics, optoelectronics and opto VLSI, which I suppose is very large scale systems integration. Kamal holds international professional professorial appointments at Guangzhou Institute of Science and Technology in Korea, uh, Glamorgan University in Wales in the UK, and Southeast University in Nanjing in China. I'd like to welcome uh, Kamal to the podium. Thank you. Today I I like to give you uh, a flavor of what uh, research activities we are undertaking at the University of Edith Cowan uh, in Jundala. I'm the director of the Electron Science Research Institute at uh, Edith Cowan University and then I've got some other colleagues to acknowledge who are uh, working with me uh, on this project. It's Dr. Feng Zhao and David Michel. Um, so this is the outline. I'd like to give you a background about what research facilities and, and activities we are undertaking. The, this uh, is important uh, uh, to show you how we develop those sensors. So what uh, areas of expertise we need to have and then what research uh, capabilities and facilities we need to have in order to develop those sensors. Although at the end there would be a small product but they need a lot of research and extensive research facility to be, to be able to develop. Uh, and then I will go into the, um, the fiber optic sensor. We've got three different projects on the three different sensors we develop. Uh, two of them are based on fiber optics and then in conjunction with micro technology or mi micro fabrication and the nano fabrication. I will go for two of them and if I have time I will go into the third one which is all uh, based on uh, nano engineered thin film technology uh, to develop pH sensor uh, sensors for water quality monitoring as well. And then I'll show you some experimental results and mainly what I'd like to share with you is we, while we are doing research uh, and then uh, to develop some uh, demonstrators for the desalination industry, our ultimate aim is to move into the commercialization of these products. So let's move them from a proof of concept benchtop demonstrator into a product that can be adopted by the, uh, the industry and then we can commercialize it at, at one stage. I just, uh, I'd like to acknowledge first the uh, financial support from the National Center of Excellence in Desolation Australia and also some colleagues. That's so why I, I, I told you before that these three people are working on this, uh, this sense of development uh, but we've got some other support from different uh, researchers within the group. Um, the Electron Science Research Institute, for example, uh, uh, David Moria is the clean room manager, so he's been putting some support and some help, and then some other, other guys like uh, Dr. Uh, Baofu Ding, and then Mikhail Vasiliev is a senior research fellow, and, and some other people. So they've, while these, these three people are the main researchers, we've got some support, in current support from other researchers. Um, just a little bit uh, about the uh, Electron uh, Science Research Institute. We focus on three different research areas and that uh, these are the photonics or the optics. Uh, this includes micro and nano and uh, optics and photonics and the electronics, micro nano electronics and the material science and then so we have very good expertise in these three different areas and then we use those to develop solutions to different industry uh, sectors such as the ICT and health and agri-bio, consumer electronics, energy security, defense, environmental applications. So we can grab any project and then we can use those three technologies to develop solutions for these uh, sectors. We also believe in collaboration, national and international level. We have a, a lot of collaboration uh, activities within Australia with other universities and institutions and also overseas uh, as I will explain. I'll talk about the key collaborators because these are the ones 
that are helping us to move the commercialization uh, uh, to research into commercialization. Well, you know, before we, um, uh, the vision also is to build a very good research infrastructure because without that, we cannot uh, first develop uh, world first or world class um, uh, uh, research activities and then outcomes. And also, we cannot engage with the industry if we don't have those research facilities and capabilities, uh, you know, as I will explain in a moment. So these are some of the research facilities that everything is needed to develop this small, tiny fiber optic sensor. And then that is when we have some good nanofabrication simulation and characterization facility. We can develop thin films. We can make new materials, compose new compositions. And we can also nano-engineer them here. As you can see here, we can actually, with the FIB, a focused ion beam and scanning electron microscope facility, we can engineer them to become, to structure them in, a, uh, in with, with the nano, with nanoscale uh, patterns. We also have some microphotonics, which is where you have the optical fiber and some microelectronics to, in, to um, control the optics as well. <clears throat> and then we also have a dedicated Micro electronics and microelectronics lab, because you know at the end any product you do, whether it's optics or based on material science, you have to interface it and to make it a product. You need to develop the electronics, the software and hardware, and then you have to have a processor within the system so to be to, for the for the system to be standalone. You need all those electronics, and then electronics is a mature technology, but we have the capability to design the electronics. Uh, software and hardware and develop it. So we have a PCB milling machine. We can make, make our own electronic uh, printed circuit boards. And we can test them and develop um, a prototype based on the use of electronics. And then, and then some materials. So this is an example of materials as well as some microelectronics that involved in this chip here. You can see this is one centimeter by one centimeter. We developed for the industry and it's just a small it's a micro display but based on some uh, magnetophotonic crystal. And then you can see that we can integrate it with the PCB and we can drive it via software and hardware to make it as a product. So we can do this from A to Z within our, uh, our institute. <clears throat> so, and because, of course, because we are a research institute within the university, we have to publish papers. So and uh, preferably you know, to, for benchmarking our activities and then to show that we are at the level of other universities. And, uh, and also we need to file patents because universities are the, uh, uh, a place for innovation. And I was talking uh, to some one colleague before that the innovation also is important within the university to drive the, uh, uh, the uh, industry. So we can feed those innovations into the industry and then the industry can adopt them and then create some jobs uh, or job opportunities. And the vision of the university is to also be very, uh, to have close engagement with the industry. And uh, because we believe that uh, through engagement we can build the partnerships and that's the aim of the university is to, although the aim eventually is to uh, establish or develop valued citizens, but also we develop that through engaging uh, staff and uh, uh, researchers and students with uh, also the industry. So we, that's why we, we focus very well on uh, industry uh, partnerships and then we have a lot of uh, contracts, research and development contracts with industry uh, partners and, uh, and it's been ongoing for uh, over the last maybe uh, 10 years we've been working with industry uh, partners. And I said partnership is also important, the national and international, because uh, through collaboration we can improve our capabilities and suppress our limitations. Um, okay, based on the performance, our performance at the at ECU, the university decided to build a new building and they uh, we propose to have a clean room facility, which is uh, this is the uh, after collaboration with uh, South Korea uh, for nearly 10 years. We thought that it is a time for us to build our own clean room facility. So we start to develop micro and nano structures. And uh, before doing this, I uh, facilitated uh, several visits by students and 
uh, staff um, research, researchers to South Korea to learn in Korea how to operate and do um, uh, clean room equipment and then how to work within the clean room environment. And when the time was suitable for us and the university wanted to expand in this area, so we proposed to go for a clean room and then they built a clean room in 2011. So we have one 256 square meters of clean room facility to see those all the facilities and all these facilities are important to develop those micro and nanostructures that I am talking about uh, in a few minutes. So you can see we have a, a, a broad range of uh, equipment that uh, are very useful for the development of any idea you can think of and you think it might be, it might have the potential we can develop now at the, at the university, at the ECU within the institute. So you can see, I'm not going to go uh, through those uh, facilities, but that, but in, in principle we can develop almost everything, almost. Uh, there's no facility that can do everything. You always uh, need to keep the collaboration. And that's why we keep the collaboration with GIST, uh, uh, Kwanzaa Institute of Science and Technology, which I'm an adjunct professor there, but I also have access to a very uh, a bigger even facility, including facility with Professor Young that me being a very good uh, colleague and uh, collaborator. He's also an adjunct professor at ECU, so that's how we uh, we publish a lot of papers together in, in high impact journals. So this uh, Kwanzu Institute is the importance of it is that we also uh, benchmark our research activities and the capabilities because they are at the moment number seven in the world for high impact publication citations per professor. They're very very good, very well funded. It's a national uh, research institute, uh, maybe top. Uh, in, in Korea or second in Korea in terms of uh, outcomes. Then when it comes to the fiber optic sensors, as I said, we can develop at the university a, a proof of concept and we can validate the capabilities and then the potential of the, uh, the demonstrator that we develop. However, when it comes to uh, develop this, move it, moving this from a bench top a product or demonstrator to a product, we cannot do it within the university because we don't have the capabilities for uh, packaging and the prototyping. And that's why we needed to go with, uh, to collaborate with uh, very capable uh, uh, organizations. And then we chose in China, uh, uh, China the Hacker Group, which is the top company in China in optics and then uh, in electronics. So they have all the facilities to develop uh, fiber optic components optical components like lenses and the coating and uh, they have very good testing facilities and they have also packaging facilities. These are some of the products that they made for themselves. And then we decided to join with them, uh, some, to put some efforts with them to actually develop some of the uh, products that we develop for the industry. And then we managed to develop several products. Uh, one of them is the weed sensor which was uh, launched as a product uh, in last February for a company uh, within WA. So Professor uh, Song is uh, a professor from uh, Peking University and we appointed him as an adjunct professor to, coop, to keep the uh, close collaboration with the company and to access all the facilities uh, that they have. As you see, this company has 3,600 3, employees and their revenue is more than 600 million uh, a year. This is an example of Professor Song. We took one of the, uh, some of the components. We developed a demonstrator for a tunable laser multiport. We took it to China and we collaborated with some universities in Beijing. And then we trained them how it works. And then they helped us in developing the packaging and the optomechanical design so that we can make it as a product. And this device is already now a product, uh, like a demonstrator that we are uh, trying to seek some investors or investment from the uh, from uh, some venture capitals to actually move it into a spin-out company. And then finally, in the area of uh, microelectronics, as I said, Australia doesn't have a semiconductor foundry to make uh, integrated circuits, uh, semiconductor uh, <coughs> integrated circuits. So we also uh, uh, started some collaboration with uh, Professor uh, Ji Gong Wang. He's, uh, with, he's the director of the Institute of RF and O. Optoelectronic integrated circuit, and this is number two in China. 
uh, in uh, microelectronics. They develop every year 100 chips, integrated circuits. So they're very good in actually uh, chip design and development and testing. And then we collaborate with them to develop um, you know, those integrated circuits that we might need for our demonstrators or for our products that we need to develop. So in, in terms of collaborative projects, we have many projects. This, uh, this project for the optical fiber sensors is actually one of the research programs that we are running. And uh, I'm going to be talking about this today. And I want to show you, share with you how we can, uh, the micro microfabrication can be used for uh, sensing the uh, salinity of water and the temperature through uh, launching an optical uh, signal into a fiber and then uh, looking at the reflected light. And then from that, we can tell the salinity and temperature of uh, the area or the spot that we are trying to sense. And also look to, to see how the nanotechnology, which is going into the nanoscale, can even uh, improve the sensitivity of this sensor, uh, maybe several orders of magnitude, by going from micro to nano. And, uh, and of course, if I have time, I will speak about this uh, uh, thin film, um, micro-engineered thin film a sensor for pH uh, uh, sensing. So, as I said, I'll speak about the microstructure, structured fiber, optic salinity and temperature. And this is funded by the National Center of Excellence for Indecentralization Australia, and then also the nano-engineered. This is called uh, surface plasma resonance-based uh, water quality sensor. This is also funded by the uh, National uh, Center for Indecentralization. The other one is funded by a different project, but uh, it is uh, very relevant to what we're doing here. And it could be used uh, for some application in water dissemination. OK, so the motivation is basically you're looking at the reverse osmosis units. And there are, uh, you know, fouling is a big problem in there and uh, those units. And you can see that in dissemination plants, you have uh, tens, maybe thousands of them. And then it's, it would be very important to sense the quality of the water inside inside them in order to um, uh, avoid uh, or, or just uh, have some early warning of fouling uh, and, then, and, then, and then you have a better uh, water treatment. So that's what we proposed uh, to uh, develop for this uh, uh, in the, within this uh, NCED. And uh, we worked on this uh, over the last uh, two years. We've been working on this development of this one, the micro and the nano uh, structured uh, fiber optic sensors. Um, just to show you, I'd give you an idea. This is this is an optical fiber. The optical fiber is uh, uh, has the thickness of a human hair. Right? It's nearly 125 microns. It's got a uh, a core inside it, which is nine microns. So very very small core, and uh, the light propagates inside the core. And then uh, we looked at some uh, structures for water sensing before we did this work, and then we found that there are there were limited uh, approaches to sense the water quality with a good sensitivity. And then uh, we uh, came up with this invention uh, that if, uh, if you look at the optical fiber and then if you make a hole from top of the fiber, it's like this right at the end or at the tip of the fiber here. And then if you immerse this fiber into the water that you want to test the salinity and or you monitor the salinity and temperature. So if you launch light into this, you can see that the light will uh, face three interfaces one two three and this is the the core is the silica and then the water and then from water to silica which is two and then from silica to water so three different uh, uh, waves will be reflected because of the change in the refractive index between the silica core and the water and those are three waves they interfere and we can monitor them at the end so before I go into this the detail I like to also uh, tell you something about uh, optical fiber. So this is a, an SEM image of an optical fiber. It's made of the silica, and then it is now uh, a very inexpensive uh, compared to 10 years ago. Uh, at the moment, you can buy an optical fiber one kilometer for uh, $7, uh, and they're good quality ones. And the, only need, the only thing we need to actually develop this sensor is basically to remove only a small part from here, which is uh, this area here to just to remove it, so we, we're not actually adding anything, we're only removing this part of the fiber, and this becomes a sensor. 
So the way it works, <coughs> before I go into the, uh, the principle, I see if you look just some background about if we look at the water refractive index versus temperature, if I change the temperature, then the refractive index of the water drops like this. But if I increase the salt concentration in water, then the refractive index increases. And this is for different types of salt. So we have two different uh, things. One in increases with the temperature and the other one, and the refractive index decreases with the uh, salinity. You know, for this fiber optic, if you look at the analysis, you can see that the reflected light that we measure, we send in the light into the fiber and the light reflects three times. And this is the formula for the reflected light. You can see it depends on the salinity and the temperature. So it depends on two variables. So we try actually to measure the reflected light and then to resolve the temperature and the salinity via sensing the light. As you can see, this is a, this curve, it shows the, the principle. If you look at one color, you find that if you, if you launch a broadband light <coughs> into this one and look at the reflected light, you will see that this broadband was like constant here. It actually has a, a notch uh, a property here and another notch, so three fringes, you could see. And those fringes will change as we change the salinity and temperature of the, uh, the water that is coming through the, the hole. So by changing, by looking at, by doing some characterization, and looking at how these fringes will change with temperature and salinity, we will be able to actually launch the light and get it back so that we can uh, measure the temperature and the salinity at the same time. By doing two measurements, which I'll explain in a moment how we do. So that's basically how the principle of this uh, uh, fiber optic sensor with the microstructures. This uh, hole is actually microstructures, which is the dimension is around 100 microns by 50 microns, something like that. So this is an experimental setup just to, to show how we do it. You can see that there's a hot plate here, and then the optical fiber, you can't see it, is very thin here. It's actually immersed in the water, and then we can add some salt, and we can heat this one. So we can have the ability to change the salinity by adding some salt, and then keep the temperature constant, or keep the salinity and change the temperature, and then look at the reflected light. So this is how the, and this is the broadband source that we use, and the uh, the optical spectrum analyzer that is using the experiment was on the opposite side of this of the experiment. But, uh, but you can see if we change the, uh, the uh, cell salt content here, like from 0 to 6 grams per liter, you can see that you will see that there are changes in these. And then you change the temperature also by keeping the salt content the same. So you look at, you know, the, you have different curves for different uh, temperature. This is what we base our sensor on, you know, to those measurements to be able to and resolve the temperature and the and the salinity. And the way it's done, first we look at the uh, uh, changing the salinity first, and then we look at the fringes. As I just said to you, we have three fringes here, and then we look at the fringes and we look how much we have a change in the uh, those wavelengths at which the notch happened here have occurs. So we look at the wavelengths uh, uh, shift here, and we look at the different fringes: one, two, three, which is the black and the red and the and the uh, blue, and then we see that the blue one has a bigger, the largest slot. So this is the most sensitive, sensitive to the change in salinity. So we take this one, when you know, to measure the the salinity and temperature. And also, when we look at the temperature, as you change the temperature, you drop uh, the the wavelength shift. Actually, goes in the opposite direction. And we look also at the at the red red uh, curve here. We see this is the most, the high largest slope. So we also take the red. Uh, red, the fringe, and the blue fringe, that they give the best sensitivity when it comes to monitoring the, uh, the salinity and temperature. And then uh, the rest of is, is very simple. We know, look at the, the relationship between the, the sh uh, fringe shift co with the ch change in salinity and temperature. It depends on this sensitivity matrix. And then basically, if you measure this sensitivity matrix, which is K, S, I, in this case, you look at the change in wavelengths. Uh, divided by the change in salinity when the temperature is constant, so we can measure that, and then we can measure the other one, which is the change in wavelengths when the temperature is constant. Uh, temperature changes, but the salinity is constant. So we can characterize this, we can measure this uh, sensitivity matrix, and then in this case we will be able to measure the salinity and the temperature change as a, a function of this change in fringes. So basically, we only need to measure the change in fringes here. And then we have this uh, matrix, the inverse of that one is available to us, so we can measure the salinity and temperature at the same time by measuring two 
and different uh, wavelength shifts. So you know the the good thing is this about this um, fiber optic. I can see this is the fiber optic sensor. You only need to have a hole here on top of it, so you can't even see it. But compared to this commercial um, um, conductivity-based um, uh, water salinity sensor, they are bulky and then they're single sensitivity. They can't tell you about the temperature or anything else, and they are very bulky and then uh, vulnerable to corrosion because they use. They're actually based on measuring the conductivity. You have to immerse conductors into the water. So as this one, this fiber optic, is just there's only silica glass, very robust with water. You only launch the light and look at it from far. And the fiber optics are not expensive at the moment, so you can have a long length of fiber. You can immerse it anywhere you want, and the light is guided. If you uh, another uh, property of the optical fiber, uh, decide that it is not uh, expensive. If you launch a, an optical signal in an optical fiber uh, for 10 meters or 100 or 1 kilometer or 10 kilometers, the light is always guided and will come back with minimum attenuation. And that's why optical fibers are used in optical telecommunication. They can go without optical amplification for nearly 100 kilometers. And you can transmit the signal without any uh, optical amplification for 100 kilometers because the, the bandwidth is very high. And also the attenuation is very small. It's 0 0.2 dB per kilometer. It's nearly nothing. 99% of the light will transmit you know, after one kilometer. So after 10 kilometers even, you can actually put more light from the input. Uh, you can uh, launch more light into the fiber. And you can still get a very good uh, reflected signal. And then you have very good, very high sensitivity uh, photo detectors that can actually monitor the light with very good accuracy. So, and then eventually it's, uh, you know, this, uh, you basically need to build a sensor network because you need to sense many uh, spots or within the dissemination. So you need to, to sense, uh, establish a sensor network. And this is very simple. Uh, you have a, you're going to have a switch here and then some photo detector to, to look at the reflected light from here and then a tunable laser or a broadband light source so you can, you can sense one at a time and then you can monitor and then you look into the switch into the other one and then sense it again and so on because the sensitivity the salinity doesn't change quickly so you can actually afford to switch the the signal very quickly from one port to the other one and monitor all of them cost effectively using a single photo detector and then a single laser source and then this is an optical switch which are inexpensive components at the moment and they are available uh, off the shelf so now this is the microstructures, as I said, and the sensitivity was uh, good but not good enough for what we needed, you know, for especially for the uh, uh, clear water. And then, uh, so what we started working on uh, is, is to use the nanotechnology to be able to improve the sensitivity uh, two to three orders of magnitude. So the first thing is, before I go into the description, I'd like to give you some background um, about how this uh, uh, surface plasmon resonance occurs in, uh, in, in uh, between the dielectric and metal uh, interface. So if you look at this uh, picture here, you find that if you, if you look at the light coming into this direction, in the prism here, I don't know what happened to this, uh, the, the figure is tilted, but it's okay, you can still see the principle. Then you look at the transmitted or reflected light from here, and then versus the angle theta, you find that uh, if the angle theta is very small, then the light does not reflect here. It actually transmits through. But at a certain a critical angle, then you will see most of the light will, will actually reflect back into this, uh, the output here. So now, if you look at this case where the light reflects, you can find that there is something called evanescent field. It's actually not all the light is reflected, but some of the light is actually going through but this uh, uh, near field is, is, is a near field standing wave. It extend, extends about half of the wavelength of the light into here, and then it decays very quickly, exponentially, as you could see here. So we use this concept in order to uh, use the nanotechnology to be able to sense the, the, the water quality. OK, so this is a, there's a problem here. I don't know what happened, but uh, uh, I don't know whether I can. Anyway, this one, this is parallel. This one is, is here. And uh, anyway, if you launch this one and you put a nano thin film of gold 
in here. This is 50 nanometers. That means the thickness of a human hair is 125, so let's divide that by around 2,000 times. Very, very thin nano layers, uh, so that this gold, if you look at it, it is actually transparent, semi-transparent. You can see through it. Okay, and you look at this one, and then you, you do the same thing, and look at the reflected light. With the gold, you don't see that the reflectance is actually small, and it goes uh, constant here, but the, it creates some uh, uh, notch characteristic here. That means at this angle, theta zero, there is no light is going out. I mean, the light is going somewhere else. And what happens is that this light, at this case, in this case, I'll take this example, then when you have this resonance happening, this light that this appears, that means it's not reflected. Where is the light going then? The light is going as a surface wave. It propagates around the surface of the gold here, and this is where the resonance uh, takes place within this, this structure. That means this light is converted into another wave that propagates along the surface, very, very thin, a very shallow uh, surface, and it prop propagates this along, along this one. We use this concept to actually for sensing the water quality, and then you can trigger this uh, surface plasmon uh, via, you can have a gap, or you can have the prism connected to the gold, or you can have some nano pattern. This is also something we want to explore in the future to increase the sensitiv sensitivity of the sensors. But the way we do, what happens is that if you look at the electric field and the interaction with the electric field with the metal, you find when, they, when they have, there is a high electric field, you can attract the positive charges and the negative charges on the opposite. So you create positive negative charges, and as the polarity of the electric field changes, then, then those negative and then positive, they change the swap positions. So you create a surface, a surface wave due to the electron, electrons being excited by the light. And this is, this is like, if you want to understand it, in a simple, a simpler way. Anyway, so what happens here? It looks like all of them are switched. Uh, anyway, so what happens? If we put some species here, you'll find that, and then look at the light that comes and reflects. You can see that the light is not, this notch is not anymore at theta zero. It actually changes to theta one. That depends on those species that we put here. So you can imagine this is water with different salinity, then this will change according to the salinity and even the temperature of the water. And that's how we can actually measure those shifts in here, and then we can, we can uh, detect the, uh, uh, the salinity, or we can characterize what's, what's happening here. OK, this is still OK. So this is OK. This is how the hour sensor. I'll give you the, the, um, the background of it. So we, we have an incident beam here, and then we've reflected, as I said before. This is the same thing. And then it said, at resonance, we have some surface plasmon is propagating. And depending on the quality of water here, or the salinity of water, we can actually uh, see the shift. Uh, and then from this shift, we can tell you know, the, the quality of the water. So to extend it a little bit better, we actually uh, we don't want to work with a very large or bulky prism, because they are not very practical. How are you going to immerse them into the water? It becomes difficult. So we came up with a different approach. This is innovative. And that is, you know, that the uh, look at the optical fiber. As you have the beam coming out of the fiber, it ex expands, diverges like this. So you use a lens to collimate it, and then you coat this prism with some gold nano layers, as I said before, and the other one with a mirror. Then the light reflects back and hits this twice. So you have a better sensitivity because you're seeing the surface plasma twice. And then it comes back, and it is coupled back into the fiber. And this circulator will route it into different outputs. So we can isolate the input from the output in this one. And this is actually the, the, uh, the um, fiber optic uh, uh, SPR, uh, surface plasma resonance-based water sensor that we developed at ECU. And then we are working on to actually make it as a um, uh, viable product. I will show you how we can do it, because it's still like you have a free space here, and then you have free space and a prism. So how are we going to do it to make it more attractive for the industry? But with this one, we have been able to detect up to down to 15 ppm, part per million. And, and we can actually do to 5, 5 ppm uh, with, a, with a good sensitivity uh, receiver. So it's very promising, and it is good for the uh, application in reverse osmosis, where the quality of water is actually very uh, very good, so we, we can sense it with good accuracy. This is uh, to show you the experimental setup. It is uh, very scary when you look at the bench top, but we have the expertise to move it into a product, a very viable product, as I will show you in a moment. So you can see when we do, we measure with this uh, 
power meter, this is the, the, the power a photo detector, and then this is the optical fiber examined here. We had like this microfluidic channel, and we have a pump before, and then the light, the, the water is pumped through a microfluidic channel, and it will hit the gold, and the light interacts with the gold, and it comes back into the fiber, and we detect it here. So this is how the experiment is done at the university. And we have this scale to put some very small, tiny amount of salt with the water. I will show you in a moment how we do that. So this is experimentally, and um, what happened, I hope this works. You can see experimentally what's happening. This is the experiment, and then you can see that we have put some salt into the water here, and this is the pump that pumps the water into the uh, microfluidic channel. It's a little bit primitive, but it tells you the concept. You know, We have to mix them you know, to dissolve all the salt so we can... Uh, and then the pump is pumping the water from through the gold all the time, so it's continuously pumping. It's not actually fixed, and you can see how this uh, the power meter changed from 24 to um, you know 27 microwatts. And I said yes, microwatts is not a small uh, it's not a, uh, a small amount when it comes to optics. We can measure up to nanowatts and even picowatts for good sensitivity receives. So we can tell solve it. Uh, we can measure, um, you know, the change in um, the surface plasma um, resonance uh, very accurately with the optics. As you can see, what's happening is this: as we change the salinity, this uh, notch um, wavelengths it shifts, and then basically you get some by shifting it. Basically, you measure a higher power and higher power as you as you fix the wavelength. So, if you use one color of the light, you can actually look at the change in salinity. And simply, because temperature also has the same effect, it, sh it, it shifts the fringe, but in a different way, so we can actually use two wavelengths. So if you launch one wavelength, one color, and another color, we get two measurements, and we can dissolve, the uh, we can dissolve this um, temperature and salinity via the, measure the two measurements using the same concept of the uh, sensitivity matrix that I showed you before. I will show again, and then you are. So then, then when it comes to measurement, you expect something linear. So you know, in the measurements, you never get something linear, but you get something uh, that is random like this around the linear. So we always fit it, and we assume this is uh, this is how the uh, the output power that we uh, sense versus the salinity, and this is for a temperature of 35 degrees. Just to give you an example, of what we how we characterize. Because once we develop the sensor, is the, the next step. And this takes a little bit of time is to characterize it at different different environments and then get all the database needed. So when you immerse it in any any place, so you uh, you know from the reflected light what you are measuring. Okay, and then and then another thing for different temperature, you can see that it changes. So we characterize everything and then we have a lookup table uh, or or you know an algorithm that can tell us from the measurements of the two wavelengths, what is the temperature and what is the salinity. And you can see that you can dissolve very well within this one, the Martin Markowatt, a good, good, you know, from no salt to one gram of salt per liter. So it's, uh, it's actually very, uh, we, can, we can measure that with a good sensitivity. And as I said before, uh, the way we do it uh, for uh, measuring the salinity and the temperature is basically to look at two uh, wavelengths and look at the reflected light or intensities for two wavelengths and then look at this sensitivity matrix and then you can resolve both of them. So when it comes to the implementation of this as a compact, a very small uh, product, this is a, it's a different, uh, different story how to integrate it and make it very robust. And this is what we do, the fiber is here, the circular, this is the same thing, but we can buy off the shelf uh, a component called fiber collimator, and this is a uh, and this is a optical fiber in, with with a lens integrated on top of it. So you don't need the free space propagation as I showed you before. And this will collimate the light to any diameter you want. And now we are, we have a prisms that are one millimeter, even 0 0.5 millimeter by 0 0.5 by 0 0.5. So we have very very tiny uh, a prisms, and we can put them in a sputtering machine. We can code them all together at one. At, at once, so it doesn't. They don't cost you anything except the glass, and then only very thin nano layers on top of them. And then you de you deposit also some mirrors here, like basically to reflect the light. And then that would be the sensor that eventually would be developed. And we uh, we are aiming to develop it like you know like this one. It's probably around a uh, few millimeters uh, in diameter, and then one one centimeter altogether. 
everything will be packaged properly and sealed uh, so that the only area that is exposed to water is the gold here. And that would be uh, the sensor that we are working on the development of. And then, of course, in, in collaboration with the collaborators that I talked to you about. So, in conclusion, um, I think that the, uh, when we proposed the microstructured fiber sensor, it was a good approach to use a simple uh, microfabrication and then basically patterning the fiber, the optical fiber, to, uh, to be able to sense via a fiber without the need of any electrical wiring or anything like that. Uh, basically, remotely launch the light and then bring it back so you can sense um, the, uh, the salinity. And then through the nano engineering, uh, we can improve significantly the sensitivity of the, uh, of the fiber uh, optic sensor through uh, the uh, phenomenon they called, uh, that is called the surface plasma resonance uh, that I explained about. So we can get the high sensitivity. Now the other thing is if we drop those gold layers that I showed you with some ligands, some different uh, ligands, we will be, or, or if we nano pattern them, we will also be able to resolve the contents of water. Well, this is the future uh, research and development that we are, uh, we are undertaking at the moment. We're looking at different possibilities uh, to be able to detect other than salinity and temperature like uh, some other uh, uh, species and then, uh, and then uh, ingredients. And at the same time, we are working uh, on the prototype development and uh, as you know, the uh, going from the center of excellence to the CRC, you probably need to focus more on the spin-out companies and you need the expertise in this uh, these development and working with industry. So this is also a good, a good outcome uh, for the uh, center uh, in this generation that we are in a position that we can move and work closely with the industry and we have the expertise. We've been doing this for a long time and we are uh, able to do this uh, uh, not very easily, but we know how to handle this pressure of the working with industry and then delivering what the industry needs, especially in, in a short time. So I think I will stop it here. I probably won't go down because I think I'm running out of time. but. Uh, I just the, the way ahead is um, I think that the nano and micro technologies uh, are very promising and there are emerging technologies that it would be good to add into the desalination industry. So, you know, this is like a new blood or new spirit added into the desalination industry. I think these technologies are becoming more mature and it is time for the desalination industry to adopt those uh, technologies. So we also, I've, I've shown that, you know, micro and nanotechnology, you know, those sensors that we develop, they are, they have the potential to be commercialized uh, in, uh, in the future for the uh, uh, desalination industry and maybe for other industries as well. And uh, it is always to keep these partnerships and collaboration because uh, you cannot do everything alone. We always need other people to share with us facilities and capabilities and ideas. And uh, you know, even when we share facilities uh, with others, we always add strength uh, to to ourselves and to the others. And then my last quote, as I you know always say, is that the collaboration is important because it multiplies capabilities and suppresses limitations. Thank you very much. So I'll leave it here. Thank you, Kamal. I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Yes. I think my mind is boggling at the moment, thinking about what it actually looks like. Um, do you have a, I mean, what would this actually unit look like? It's like a, you can think of a, a human hair, and the end of it is like a small cylinder uh, uh, that is, uh, a stainless steel cylinder of a diameter maybe two to three millimeters and the length of one centimeter. So what I mean is the, the housing of it like? This is all together. And then we will be launching light into the optical fiber and looking at the reflected light and from a remote site. So you can actually... Sorry, would this application be um, useful for a seawater real-time monitoring? Of course, real-time monitoring. This is for real-time monitoring. Real-time yep. monitoring. Yep. Right. This is definitely you can do it. Mm real-time monitoring because uh, 
as I said, the optical fiber is also at any depth you need to put the fiber, the sensor will be okay because the length of the fiber is not very uh, important in terms of the attenuation of the light. It is, if it is 100 meters or 5 kilometers, you can still launch a signal and it comes back guided within the fiber with minimum attenuation. Thank you. No problem. Come on, thank you very much for that. I've seen your work so <laughs> at, at the at the laboratory and uh, on the bench. Congratulations again. Thank on you. That. Um, the question is: um, Do you need any standardization of this before experimentation, uh, or once you set it, is it continuously uh, giving you the results without? Uh, Again, standardization. You mean so you mean calibration? Calibrate. Yeah. Oh, Do yeah. you have to calibrate at every <coughs> reading? We can, yeah, we can calibrate it by having another sensor with pure water, yes, and then we can always calibrate more with this. But in general, once you have it, you can quickly calibrate it via this algorithm you develop. And later, when you develop it, the fiber will come. You know, the fiber, the the light that you detect, will be processed electronically with an algorithm. Uh, that has all the information from these uh, characterizations that we undertake before uh, deploying this commercially. So you can, once you measure, you can always include in the algorithm some processes for calibration very quickly, and then you deploy it, whatever you need to do. So that's that's very simple. You know, by comparing, you know, what you're measuring with something standard, and you can always calibrate your uh, your sensor. Uh, so, uh so that translates to an in-situ device that yeah. will be continuously giving you Continu real time. Yes, service. exactly. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Thank you. Um, Kamal, I have a question about this pri prism sensor. Yes. Um, one of the plots showing that the, in, on the high temperature, it seems like the sensitivity drops a little bit. Well, the, the uh, fresh water and one gram dissolve reading is closed. Is it um, some uh, temperature or salinity interval which these sensors are more sensi sensitive to uh, measurements, or it uh, could be wider wide range of salinity sensor? You mean the wide range of temperature or salinity? Both. Well, uh, I mean, on the plot it was we, temperature. So yeah, but probably like we don't. When we do this, we don't go more than maybe 50 degrees in characterization. We don't go beyond this because at the moment it's like we are proving the concept, and then we can calib calibrate later when we develop the the sensor totally. But you know, you can always with temperature, for example, from zero to 50 degrees, you can always resolve them and resolve the salinity, which. We are more interested in the small, in the clear water, so we're looking at you know very small um, uh, amount of values of ppm part per million. So we're looking at those when we focus on that one, so we can resolve that higher uh, concentration. We can always resolve them easily because there's, it's not challenging as for the higher one because you can always see the changes in the, in the fridge. But you know for the small changes, we need to resolve the fridge and then do some measurements. To, to resolve them accurately. So small um, EC and high temperature are um, potentially more difficult to, to deal with. In terms the high of temperature? Monitoring. I mean, in the experiments, it's the same. We always resolve them you know, up to 50. But maybe higher, it could be. It could be. It depends if the sensor saturates or something for any reason. We haven't tested that yet. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, if that's all we have, I'd like to thank you once again, Professor Kamal Alamath, for your presentation. Thank you very much.